my pleasure to introduce our guest today, Tom Willis. Tom Willis is currently serving as the CEO and President of Conestoga Energy Holdings, LLC, whose primary business is the production and trading of renewable fuels. Under Tom's direction, Conestoga Energy Holdings has grown from a startup company with four employees 11 years ago to a diversified company with current gross annual revenues of over $1.5 billion. In addition to Conestoga Energy Holdings, Tom is involved in several other diverse business ventures, including farming, a trailer leasing and repair business, and a feed manufacturing company. Tom currently serves on the National Sorghum Producers Board of Directors, the Koch Foundation's Youth Entrepreneur Board, and the Seward County Hospital Board of Trustees. He is past chairman of the Kansas Association of Ethanol Producers and past president of the Montana Grain and Feed Association. He is also very active in local, state, and national politics. Tom Willis graduated with a bachelor's degree in business administration and agricultural economics from Utah State University. Ladies and gentlemen, Tom Willis. Where do you, where do you want me? Up on the podium? Wherever you want. Can everybody hear me? Well, it is an honor to be here. I didn't expect uh, so many people. And this is a diverse group. Let me, let me tell you the challenges that's facing me today. I've got family here, so I can't embellish there. <laughs> I have guys here that served missions uh, in our church out in Kansas, so I can't tell any suggestive jokes. So I'm sitting here trying to rehash <laughs> my comments with, uh, with all that. But it is, it is grateful to be here and to have an opportunity to, uh, to share maybe just a few insights uh, that I've picked up over my life. As, as mentioned, um, my roots are from uh, over in Bear Lake. I currently live in uh, southwest Kansas. Uh, liberal Kansas, not because we're liberal. We ran the last one out about four years ago, but because uh, when the settlers were coming through Kansas, they were liberal with their water. Though I always have to tell people that. That's how it got its name. Uh, we've lived out there for about 16 years. It's hard to believe that it's been 45 years, 43 years since I went to school here. Um, how this campus has grown and what a magnificent uh, university it is. So, but anyway, um, there's five or six points that I would like to make today and I would like to do that in context of sharing with you uh, a little bit of, uh, about my life. I started school here in 1975 and uh, I had one goal that I wanted to do in life, and that was I wanted to farm. That was the only thing I wanted to do. So when I came here, I was involved in ag, livestock judging team, um, a lot of activities like, like that. I just now, as I stood up here, got a bill from my attorney. I called him last week, and I asked him a simple question. Uh, I bought a piece of repossessed ground and I wanted to know if I could store something on it. It was a two second conversation. I just got a bill for 120 bucks. So if there's anybody here that is not majoring in law, do. Because <laughs> I'm in the wrong profession. That was an expensive answer. I just got it just a few seconds ago. Um, I had the opportunity when I um, was a senior to finally live my dream and I bought a farm up in Bancroft, Idaho. My grandparent, my grandpa, my uncles moved there and I bought a farm and I was living my dream. It's the thing that I'd always wanted. Moved up there, 1980, 81, went broke in 1986. Worked my butt off while I was up there. That was my dream. This was not the way my life was supposed to have turned out. I remember when I turned 30 years old, walking out on the street in Soda Springs, Idaho, on my birthday. I was just about a million dollars in debt. 
And I didn't know what I was going to do because the bank had just turned me down for a loan. And I think it's probably, I've, I've got, I guess you call them BFFs today. My time, we just called them close friends uh, here today. And I, I, I think I called you and I broke down. Because my dream was gone. Thing that, the only thing that I'd wanted in life was taken from me and it wasn't my fault. So the first point that I'd like to make today, guys, Life is not fair. Many of you have grown up in an environment, and you don't need to raise hands, and I'm certainly not being condescending, but you've grown up in an environment where you got trophies for participating. Just think back. You don't have to raise hands. Or they didn't keep score of the game. We did that because... My generation wanted to make sure that your generation felt good about themselves. We did you a disservice. The first thing I'd lesson I would like to tell you today is life is not fair. You can work your butt off for your dream, and you can still fail. And it won't even be your fault. So as you prepare to go out, understand that understand that life is not fair. When I was there, I was so depressed about that that I literally thought about taking myself up in the hills, putting a gun to my head, and just ending it. I was that d depressed about it. My wife was six months pregnant with my daughter. And I thought to myself, it actually drove up there with the idea of doing it. And I thought, that is kind of a, a, uh, a chicken way out with a pregnant wife and a two-year-old son. So I came back, regrouped, and said, now what am I going to do? Second lesson that I'd like to leave you with today, or second point, is you will fail. If you don't fail out there sometime in your life, you are not pushing the envelope. People who come to work for me, we have, well, we just bought another company, so I don't know, 250, 260 employees, and the ones that I interview for junior executive levels that I'm involved in, I'll ask them, and I'm going to tell you guys, one of the questions I ask is, how do you handle failure? How do you handle mistakes? How do you handle it when life doesn't treat you the way that you want it to be? Because I want to know what kind of character you got. So as you guys are going through college today, think about that in mind. If things don't work out quite the way I want them to, if I don't get that dream job, if I don't get that uh, uh, scholarship that I wanted or a few things like that, how am I going to react to that? Because it's not whether you will fail or whether you will make a mistake in your life, guys. It's just when. But the defining moment in your life will be what do you do with it. I could have shot myself there. I could have. It being a nice little tombstone over in Lake Town. Hopefully my family would bring a few flowers, maybe not. Maybe not. <laughs> I'd like to think they would. But I chose a different route. Well, I hadn't finished my college degree. But I went to for work for a company by the name of General Mills. You guys ever heard of them? Wheaties? I'll tell you a story about Wheaties. Uh, I worked my, my way up through the company. And uh, one of the assignments that I had was finding a way to improve their cereals. So I'll let you in on something. Cereal is sold by weight, not by volume. But I came up with a specific wheat that actually, when we made Wheaties, had more curl in it. Okay? Flat versus curled. When you curl something, it takes up more space. So we can fill our boxes fuller. And when people open up a box of Wheaties versus cornflakes, which 
Kellogg's, which at that time was a dirty name, they would look at it and say, I'm getting better value by buying Wheaties. So anytime you buy a box of Wheaties, even today, it was a wheat that uh, my team put together on it. But I felt like we should be on the cover of a Wheaties box. I did. I said, my wheat in the damn box, we ought to be able to be on the thing. Well, I talked with my buddy in PR, and he said, are you a famous athlete? Did you do anything famous at Utah State? I said, maybe some infamous things, but nothing very famous. Well, are you a great politician? I said, no. I'm full of BS, but not a, poli but not a great politician. He said, well, there's, there, there's no way I can get you on a Wheaties box. Well, a year later, we bought Pillsbury. And uh, we merged, and he called me, and he says, dude, he said, you still want to be on the box or something? I said, absolutely. He says, I got it for you. What is it? He says, we need somebody to be the dough boy. And he says, you're white and fat. And he says, I can't think anybody to be more ready. I said, you got to be kidding me. And he goes, no, no. He says, if you want to be the spokesman, he says, you can be the voice of the Pillsbury Doughboy. Obviously, I said no. <laughs> but I worked myself up through uh, General Mills, starting a little country elevator, dumping trucks, grain trucks, up to where I was the uh, region manager over all of the risk management uh, for the Pacific Northwest Grain Ops, and from there involved in how did we make better products, and that's how I came up with the, with the wheat. In the meantime, and it took a while, we were able to satisfy, remember that debt that I told you that I had? We were able to find a way to be able to pay <clears throat> most of that back. So, we ended up living in Montana, and uh, my, my travels from Montana, uh, we had a white wheat, hard white wheat, that we used in a flour called Better for Bread. I don't know whether you guys have ever seen it, it's a yellow. It took me to Kansas, and I got to make some friends in Kansas. One day, I had a guy call me. He said, hey, how would you like to come to Kansas? And uh, we've got an agriculture co-op that's in trouble. Be a big fish in a little pond. At the same time, General Mills was trying to get me to move to Minneapolis. And I didn't really want to move to Minneapolis. So I said, well, let me come and talk. Now, my wife, in the meantime, I should say we had moved down to Idaho Falls, close to her family, close to my family, we could come down here to all the basketball, football games. And my wife, uh, she says, now you know I'm not moving to Kansas, right? I said, honey, don't worry. They just want to talk to me. No big deal. She said, just understand, Tom. Families may be forever, but marriages won't be if we go to Kansas. <laughs> so I came out to Kansas met with them, had to be out there for business about two weeks later. They said, stop by, meet with us again. And this was in Dodge City. You guys don't know where Dodge City, you've heard of the movie Gunsmoke, the TV series Gunsmoke? Well, there actually is a Dodge City. Um, got done meeting with them, and at that time, they had what they, these old bag phones. You guys probably don't remember them, but they didn't have cell phones. They had bag phones. And they were laid out there. And I was punching in to see how many messages I had maybe missed while I was in the meeting. And I looked up, and the board of directors for this co-op had surrounded my vehicle. I thought, holy buckets, what's going on here? Tapped on the window and rolled it down, and they said, we want to hire you. What would it take to get you to come? Now, what would a rational man say? Rational man would say, you know, no, I need to think about this. I need to go talk to my wife. I'll get back in a couple of weeks. But I mentally put a number together that I thought, well, there's two th one of two things here. Either they'll say no, 
or it'll be good enough that my wife will move to Dodge. So I mentally did a number, threw it out there, and they said yes. And the first thing that I'm thinking to myself is, I got to call and tell my wife. So I called my wife, and it was a very one-sided conversation. And I ended up moving out there by myself. My wife said, we're, we're not leaving. I, um, I had a daughter that was a junior in, college, uh, junior in high school. Uh, so we kind of commuted back and forth. Got there, found out that the company was in worse shape than they thought. They'd been losing about eight or nine million bucks a year. Um, and I told her, I said, well, even if you wanted to move honey, I don't think I can pull this off, but you just better stay put in, in Shelly, Idaho Falls. Well, with a little hard work, a little bit of luck, a few things like that, we're able to turn the company from losing eight million to making six, three years. And that word kind of got, got out there. Second point that I would, uh, or third point that I would leave you as we talk about this is don't be afraid to get out of your comfort zone. Now, I would not suggest not talking to your spouse about taking a job and moving 2,000 miles away. But I am saying that as you guys look to graduate from college, as you look to develop your careers, don't be afraid to get out of comfort zone. I've got a cousin that turned Democrat. I know. I know. <laughs> he did. He got out of his comfort zone and his family values, as far as that goes, <laughs> so that he, huh, Brandon, so that he could, he's here, so that he could progress his career. And guess what? He ended up being a senior advisor for the Secretary of Ag. He got out of his comfort zone. Don't be afraid to get out of your comfort zone. Don't be afraid to take a chance out there. Because remember the thing I talked about before, everybody's going to make a mistake. Everybody, I guarantee it, sometime in your life, you're going to make a mistake, you're going to fail at something. It's not, and you're going to hear me say this over and over, it's not whether you fail, it's what you do when you do fail. So we turned this around. And... Uh, But I felt pretty good about myself. My wife was actually coming to see me monthly. She hadn't left me. A um, group of investors came to me and said, we want to put together some renewable fuel plants. We've heard good things about you. Would you like to be part of it? Now, this time I did the right thing. I called my wife. I said, I want you to come out and meet these people. We're going to go a different direction. She came out. She met them. She liked them. She said, we'll go for it. And I started Conestoga Energy, which is a company that, that I work for now with it. Um, we got there. We found out that we had, a, uh, first thing I found out out of the gate is that they had a fictitious lender. Here's another rule I want you to write down. Not everybody plays by the rules. This individual had fooled these group of investors into thinking he was rich and had made a fictitious loan for $200 million. He didn't have 10 cents to back it up. But he did have was a mortgage on the company. And he lived in Canada. So when I found all that out, my job was to get him to move from Canada, or not to move, to come from Canada to Kansas so that I could subpoena him so that I could get him to remove the mortgage so that I could go get it financed. I hired two, so I came up with this masterful story. Remember when I said I was good at BS? Oh, it was beautiful. <laughs> he flies in, but before I had my lawyer with the subpoena in the men's bathroom at the airport, I hired two K-State football players, both of them linebackers. And I said, I want you posed because if he gets off this plane, and he acts like he's going to get run back and get on it. You tackle him. I give you 200 bucks just to be there. 500 bucks if you tackle him. But if you miss, 
So I had them posed. They were ready. <laughs> so the plane lands. He gets off. He's got his wife. He's looking around because he's wondering if there's something up. I take him to the office. My wife uh, takes his wife. They're going to go. He said, liberal is the land of Dorothy. I don't know how it got named that, but to Dorothy's house. And make a long story short, in my conversation, I told him, you're going to release this mortgage today. And he says, no, I'm not. And I said, yes, you are. And my attorney popped out and served him with a subpoena. And uh, at the end of the day, we got the mortgage released. But needless to say, he was upset. I called my wife. I said, get his wife back here right now. She goes, well, we're still having fun. I said, sweetie pie, I'm not asking. Get his wife back here so they can get home. Next day, he calls me, and he says, I'm putting a contract out on you. He says, you cost me a lot of money. I said, really? You're going to have somebody come down and shoot me? And he goes, absolutely. Said, okay. I said, you do know that Kansas is known as the land of God and guns, right? He says, I'm going to, I'm going to have you shot. I said, well, bring it on down. So I went to the police and I said, hey, I got a guy, you know, business deal went south. He says he's going to put a contract out on me. What do I do? He said, well, they said, if you see him, shoot him. <laughs> Guys, I got six guns out of that for my wife without my wife getting mad. Six. <laughs> I got six. Because she was worried. Well, maybe you need to go buy some more. I said, oh, I think so, honey. <laughs> I think so. Uh, I don't know whether you ever put the contract out or not, but I, obviously I'm still here today. I'm still here today. And we were able to get the company refinanced. It was in a very tough environment because at that time, as 2007, the marketplace uh, could see that there was more ethanol and biodiesel plants being built than what we had demand for, and there's nothing more powerful than the market. You will learn that as if you, for those of you that are in business, it doesn't. This is a saying that we use: it never pays to be right if the market is wrong. Trust me, I've learned that the hard way. Nothing is more powerful than the market. And the market came in and said, we have too many ethanol plants, too many biodiesel plants being built. So trying to get financing was tough. I finally had a company by the name of Merrill Lynch. You guys ever heard of him? Anybody here work for him? They said, we'll loan you the money, but it's LIBOR plus 12. That's 15% interest. Tony Soprano will give you better money than that but I needed $300 million, and they were the ones that would loan it to me. But they said, you need to understand, Tom, when we loan you this money, we fully expect that you'll default, and we're going to pick up our plant for penny, your plant for pennies on the dollars. Exact quote. I said, really? You're going to take my company, my plant? They said, yeah, there's no way you can pay us 15% interest. Not in an environment where there's negative crush margin, plants are going broke. Well, I think the first two, three years, I paid $60 million in interest on that thing. But we made it. And we made it because we told ourselves we will not fail. We will not fail here. You know, Probably 95% of the people in this room are smarter than I am. And I know with my family here, they'll vouch for that. I'm not the smartest person in the world. Here's another lesson that I'd like you to, to, uh, point, to, to point down. You don't have to be the smartest person in the world. You can just be average. But there's one thing that I told myself in business. I said, you know what? I know I'm not the smartest, but there's nobody that's going to outwork me. Nobody can outwork me because I am the one that can determine how hard I work. And we were able to get through that. And we were able to get them paid off. 
and get different financing. Get different financing with it. One day, on a Saturday afternoon, I had one of the investors in the plant company call. And he said, I've been thinking that you're paying too much in tax. And I've got some things I want to do. And I'm like, why is this 80-year-old multimillionaire calling me on a Saturday afternoon wanting to know about my taxes? Um, well, I'd been getting some other job offers because there were other companies that were in trouble. And he didn't want me to leave. So he said, come on up here, let's talk about this. So I would go up there, and he said, uh, I'm going to loan you some money so that you can buy some shares in the company because things weren't looking real good. People wanted to share. I said, really? All right. Now, I'm thinking, you know, $10,000, $15,000, $20,000. The guy handed me a check for $3 million. bucks. I looked at it. I said, did you mean to give me this? He said, yeah, I believe in you. Do you believe in yourself the way I believe in you? First time that I'd ever had anybody ask me that question. Do you believe in yourself the way I believe in you? This is how much I believe in you. Used the shares, bought the stock at half price, leveraged it, ended up to where I was the second biggest owner of the company. Couldn't believe it happened. We had some other investors, and it's kind of interesting that uh, they didn't particularly like me. They wanted to sell their shares. They had... Uh, $12 million worth. And so they said, we're, we're going to go tell the board that you're not a compliant CEO. And I said, why am I not a compliant CEO? And they said, well, it was some cocky story about, I had a, I had an undocumented uh, uh, worker in the company that I'd put $60,000 into training him to run centrifuges. We'd gone through E-Verify e and everything like that. We thought they were legal, found out they weren't, but I wasn't going to let him go. So they said, we're going to get you fired because of it. Or you can just buy our shares. Find somebody to buy our shares. So I went to the guy. He says, go rent your best deal. Told me dollars. So I, I negotiated a deal. We got him priced at 10. I called him and I said, uh, hey, they're ready to sell them to you. He said, well, come on up. Let's go get the transaction done. Walked into the bank. Guy pulls out a $10 million check with my name on it and says, you're going to buy these, not, not me. Are you sure you really want to do this? And he goes, yeah. reason that I tell you that, guys, is do you believe in yourself the way other people believe in you? Do you? Ask yourself that. That man believed in me more than I believed in myself. And you know what that did for my confidence when he did that? I'd run through a frickin' machine gun for him or to do anything because of the belief that he had in me with that. We needed a, uh, one of the byproducts of, of, of uh, producing ethanol. Ethanol is just alcohol. It's Everclear. I know nobody in this room would know what Everclear is, and if you did, you wouldn't admit it. I won't say whether I do or not. Maybe I do. But uh, the byproduct of it is is mash. It's just the, what's left over when you've taken the starch out of corn, and it makes great cattle feed. But we produce about 100 loads a day, and we didn't have anybody to haul it. So I decided to start a trucking company. So we went out, and we bought 80 trailers. And I, I developed a program uh, where I would go to a lot of the, the uh, Hispanics are very entrepreneurial in southwest Kansas. 
they would go buy a truck. They wouldn't have the money to buy the insurance or fuel or, or anything with it. So I, I went to him, I said, tell you what, you buy the truck, I'll finance your insurance, I'll, fin I'll finance your fuel, I'll finance your, tr your, your, uh, your tires, you can pull my trailer, I get X percent of the load, and we, can, we will make it work. And I was able to, to take that business. Uh, we started, like I said, I think we originally started with, with 50, and I think we've got 100 truck trailers right now that we have out there. And you know what I'm most proud about that? That's 100 jobs that we provided. That's 100 people that are putting food on their table for their families. So yeah, I like making money. I'll guarantee it. There's nothing better than the high that comes from making money, but there's nothing better from the high when you watch somebody that works for you go buy their first home. That's a high that stays with you forever. They can't take that away. I was really proud of that, that the hundred jobs that we were able to create with that. And we're still a very booming business for me today with that. Well, we looked at our, our repair bills one day. I was looking at it and I said, goodness gracious. Elder, if you weren't here, I'd say something different. <laughs> but I said, goodness gracious. This is a lot. So I decided to start a maintenance repair company. And because I'm in Kansas, you know, if you can't be with the one you love, you've got to be with the one, you know, be the, can't be with the one you love, love the one you're with type deal. And so back there, everybody's K-State. So we called it PowerCat uh, Repair. And so now, not only do we repair all of uh, the semis and the trailers for the people that work for me, but I went and bought uh, 15 semis of my own. We repair those, and then we do work for custom work, anybody that wants to pull by and, and, and do that. So we found a need. There was a need. By supplying that need, or for fulfilling that need, it became profitable. But it also gave back and, and again, created more jobs with that. Remember when I started down this boring story of, to begin with what I told you what my ultimate goal in life was? The farm. So I bought a quarter ground. A quarter ground is 160 acres, just FYI for reference. One quarter equals 160. Uh, we bought that eight years ago. And uh, I've got a partner that partnered with me. We've, we've grown the farm from 160 acres to right now we're farming over 8,000 irrigated. We run cattle. Um, we'll, we'll bring in anywhere from 500 to 1,500 uh, steers and put them on wheat pasture a year. Um, and we've done that in the last seven, seven years, six years, I guess, seven. I will tell you a funny story. There was a farm ranch that came for sale. I, there was four quarters, 100, 640 acres I wanted to buy. Well, it was a 7,000 acre ranch. And I went there with my partner. I wanted to buy these four. He says, why don't we just buy the whole thing? He says, we're the big dogs in the room. Let's just buy the whole thing. I said, well, really, all I want to do is buy four. I said, but you know what? Works for you, works for me. Yeah, I'm good with it. Well, we start bidding. And usually the way we're able to buy ground, people know who we are. Uh, it sounds egotistical, but it's not. And they, they know that, that they're not going to outbid us if we want it. These guys over there are getting pretty aggressive with their bids. Finally, I, I told my partner, I said, I'm gonna, let me just walk over and see who these guys are. I don't know anybody around here. So I go over there and I introduce myself and he's introduces back. I says, who are you with? He says, uh, Desert Land and Livestock. Oh, you're with the LDS Church. Yes, we are. I walked back to my partner. I said, put your bidding card down, boy, because I said, we ain't, we ain't out bidding them. <laughs> I said, that ain't going to happen. I said, they are the big dog in the room today. He said, really? He didn't. 
know much about the, the, the uh, LDS church. I said, just trust me. If they want to buy this, they're going to buy it. So he still talks about the day that we got outbid by a church. <laughs> I says, it's not a church. It's the church. Come on, Cecil. <laughs> so anyway, but we built that up because there was a need. There was a bankrupt uh, uh, ethanol plant down in Texas that came for sale. This is a great, uh, I love this story. Um, we went down to the, bank op, the uh, bankruptcy court when they put, were going to put it up for auction. There was another company there. Well, the guy at the other company did not like me. I know that's hard to believe. He didn't like me. So when I walked in, he said, uh, you don't need to be here buying on this thing. Just go away. And I said, well, I said, we brought our checkbook today and we're here to buy. But I said, here's what I'll do to you. Now, this is kind of, do we have any lawyers in the room? Kind of maybe a little gray, I don't know. But I said, I'll tell you what, I'll give you two million bucks, you leave, or you give me two million bucks and I'll leave. One of us is going to make, but we're both going to win. We're going to steal this thing, we're going to steal the plant, and you're going to go home two million bucks richer, or you can have the plant, I'll, I'll take the money, we'll go home. He said, no, I don't want to do that. I said, okay. So we started bidding on it, and about 10 minutes later, I get this text from him that says, is that deal still good? I said, absolutely. He said, you guys go ahead and buy it. Got an $80 million, $80 million plant for $9 million plus the two that I had to pay him off, $11 million. Bucks. One of the best buys I ever made with it. There was a need for pellets for feed down in the Texas Panhandle. Again, looking for a, for, for a, for a need, so we added a, a feed mill. And we make a 100%, it's a, anybody in animal science, it's a 34 protein um, pellet, but it's a, a nine fat, 9% nine fat. Won't go into the dynamics of a rumen, but a rumen needs protein and fat, it doesn't need starch. So we take the starch out and make alcohol out of it, and what's left over, we can press into a tube. That's grown into a, to a, very, nice, to a very nice business from that perspective. All of that because I was willing to step out of my comfort zone. I was willing to step out of my comfort zone. Because I'm about half seen, I'll always write down, you know what is cool about this phone? It recognizes my face. Do you guys know that your phones will do that? My IT guy had to set it up for me. I didn't know how to do it, but all I have to do is look at it and smile. Um, so here's a couple things that I would like to, uh, I'd like to leave you with, maybe take a few questions. Number one, as I said earlier, life is not fair. Number two, there are winners and losers. Regardless of what you've been told, when you get into the business world, there are winners and losers. There are people that will be promoted. There are people that will not be promoted. You will not get a ribbon for participating. I promise you that. There are winners and losers in life. Do not judge whether you win or lose by the amount of money you make. That's something that goes easily. As I mentioned earlier, I don't consider myself to be rich, but I will tell you that when I look at that we've got vicariously about 400 jobs and I have an employee come and tell me, hey, my son or my daughter just started college and it's the first one in the family that's been able to go to college and it's the job that you provided that allowed me to do it is worth all the money in the world. It's not about money. As you're out there trying to decide what you want to be in life, remember the world owes you nothing. We just came through an election. And I'm going to editorialize here for just a second. If I offend somebody, I don't mean to, but you know what? I paid, for, I paid to come, so I'm going to say what I want. <laughs> There's a lot of people that talk about free. We need free medical health. We need free college. 
When I went to school here, I worked at the university farm for $1.20 an hour shoveling pens out to make money. And I had a 7.30 math class. Now, nobody wanted to sit by me. But I made it through school. Nobody owes you anything. You get in life what you're willing to work for. That's an, that's an attitude that is not, in, in today's society, is not necessarily shared. They want something for free. There is nothing for free. There is no free lunch out there, guys. Somebody's paying the bill. You want free medicine? That's great. Somebody's paying the bill. You want free education? That's great. Somebody's paying the bill. And I kind of look at it and I say, I paid my way through school. Why the hell should I pay for you? Why should I pay for you? Don't mean to offend you, but that's how I feel. There's not such a thing as a free lunch out there. There really isn't. As you're out there and you're deciding what you want to do in life, and this is one thing, please take away from this, find something you have a passion for. I have not gone to work for 20 years. And people say, well, what do you mean? You work 80-hour weeks. Yes, I do. But I haven't gone to work for 20 years. Why? Because I love what I do. I typically try to be there by 5 in the morning, and sometimes I don't get home till 9 or 10 at night, depending on what we're doing, and I love every minute of it. There is not enough money out there for you to take a job that you don't like, and I'll tell you why. You get that job, let's just say it's a $150,000 a year job, but you hate it. But you say, you know what, I'll live conservatively. No, you won't. You upgrade your car, you upgrade your house, you take a vacation, you get this thing in the mail that says you're eligible for a $100,000 gold credit card, and pretty soon your standard of living has raised to where that $150,000 is being spent. And now here's where you're at. You've got a standard of living that you're used to for $150,000, and you're going to a job that you hate. And life is too short for that. I feel sorry for people that when they get up in the morning, don't look forward to going to work. You guys have that opportunity now to establish that. As you're going into your different fields and different careers, don't be afraid to fail, as you've, you heard me say earlier, but find something you have a passion for. Find something you like to do. I don't care what it is. If it's teaching school, if it's coaching, if it's law, if it's business, if it's flying an airplane, if it's the military, whatever it is, find a passion, something that you have a passion for, and do it. That, that way, when you get ready to retire, you can say, I never went to a day of work. My wife has asked me, wait, actually my wife, my father, you can verify that, right, Dale? Why don't you retire and move back home? Move back to Cache Valley, move back to Bear Lake. I said, well, what's retirement, Dad? What, being able to do what you want to do and not worrying about anything? I said, I do what I want to do now. Find, if I could leave you with anything, find something that you've got a passion for. You might fail in it. That's okay. You'll, do, you'll, you'll, be, you'll be fine. You heard me talk a lot about a partner. As you're out in business, as you're out today, if you do internships, find a mentor. Find somebody in the field that you want to go in that is willing to mentor you. And there are plenty of people that are willing to do that. And then you know what? Listen to what they have to tell you. Listen to them. My mentor told me once I have all the time in the world for people that want to listen. I have no time for somebody that won't. Find a mentor and listen to what they or she has to tell you. Philosophically, guys and ladies, decide now what your values are. 
And, I, and I'm not here to preach what value should be or what value shouldn't be. But decide now, as you're going through school, what you stand for. Because if you don't stand for something, you stand for nothing. And when you get in the business world or whatever world that you choose to get into, if you don't have values that you subscribe to, you'll get caught up in a whirlwind that will take you places you do not want to go. I spend a lot of time on, on Capitol Hill, do a lot of lobbying efforts. Uh, I've had the opportunity to meet with the current president three or four times. People ask me what he's like. He's a great guy. I will tell you, off the record, measured hands with him. My hand's bigger. What's worth? Um, but stand for something. We live in a world today where there's no moral compass. The world is losing its way. And again, I'm not here to tell you what your principles should or shouldn't be. But to define and decide what your principles are and then decide that you will live by them, whatever they are. Make that decision and that choice now because when you get out in the work field, there's going to be several voices barking in your ear. And if you have not decided what your principles are, somebody else is going to decide for you. And I'll promise you, 75% of the time, you will not like the outcome when somebody else picks what your principles should be. And I can tell you what my four are. These are my four. I wrote these down 15 years ago. Actually, yeah, 15 years ago. I decided in my life that my first goal was to care for people. Regardless of what I did in life, I wanted to be, when I died, I wanted to know that I made a difference in somebody else's life. So I have these actually in my, in my bathroom. I have them in my office. I have them in all my companies. I have them in my trucks. I have them on my farm because I want people that work for me to know what principles I stand for. Hence, these are the principles that my company stands for, and these are the principles. When you work for me, at least while you're on the job, you will subscribe to. There is no compromise with them. One is caring for people. The second one is accountability. One of the things we lack in this world is holding each other accountable. In our company, the reason we've been successful is we hold each other accountable. We say what we do, and guess what? We do what we say. Accountability. Integrity. Conestoga, Powercat, TNO Farms, Diamond Energy, We're, we have integrity. I shook hands with a guy once on drilling a well. A well is a half a million dollar oil well, half a million dollars. Just shook hands with him. I'd take 50% of it. It was a dry hole. No contract. I could have walked away from that thing, and a lot of people would have. He came and he said, you know, we don't have a contract. He said, I've been up all night wondering whether you were going to pay me or not. And I said, here's the check. Why? Because I had decided 15 years ago that my integrity, my soul, was not worth bastardizing. There is not a price on it. At least I haven't found the price yet. It may it might be one. I just haven't found it yet. And the last one, and this is one as you, as you are here in college and as you're going out, have a passion for excellence. Whatever you do, tell yourself you're going to be the best at it. Remember earlier I said nobody can outwork you? They might be smarter, but they can't outwork you. Decide now, whatever chosen fields you go into, that nobody will outwork you. Have that passion to be the best you can be. Don't settle for mediocrity. Don't live. A, old men and women do not sit around and talk about what they did in their life. They sit around and they talk about what they wish they would have done. And a lot of that is having that passion for excellence. Don't do things halfway. When you go to work for a company, I'll just give you some real cheap advice here and then I'll shut up. Um, Be the first one that the boss sees in the morning. 
be the last one that he sees when he goes home. I will tell you, in my company, I make it a point to be the first one there in the morning. And if I'm not running to the farm or to another business, I'm the last one they see when they go home. Why? Because I kind of want to lead by example. And it's amazing how contagious that gets. When you go for a job interview, now this is a question I'll just throw out to the group. What do you think the number one thing that an employer is looking for when somebody asks in an interview? Anybody? What do you think the number one thing that, they're, they're, that the person that's interviewing is looking for? Oh, come on. Some of you guys are seniors. Going to be, you're going to be interviewing. What? Okay, that's, that's, that, that's one, but it's not the thing. That's, that's nice, although I've got some people that work for me that I don't really care for they're like we're not. <laughs> huh? That's a great one. And I had somebody tell me once they thought they deserved a bonus because they were there at 8 o'clock and stayed till 5. And I said, dude, I expect that. Passion. Passion's a good one. You guys are getting close. That's a good one. Character. That's a good one. They're all good, but they're not exactly what, you know what they're really looking for? Can that person do the job? I'll ask people, why should I hire you? I always ask that, why should I hire you? Tell me. And they'll say, well, because I'm punctual and this and that. And I said, no, that's not what I want to hear. I want to hear you come across the table, grab me by both hands, my hand, and say, you should hire me because I can do the job. I can make you the money, or whatever it is you want to do. All those things you talked about are great, but I tell you what that employer wants to hear, that you got enough self-confidence, enough belief in yourself, that you can do the job. I know I gotta go, but I got one more thing. <laughs> Give back. When you get, and every one of you are gonna be successful, I know. When you get to be successful, don't forget to give back. Remember the next generation. Mentor that generation. Give back to society. I try to give out 10 scholarships a year. Unfortunately, they're all Kansas schools. I guess I should come out here and give some out here. A year. It's why I'm part of the Coke Youth Entrepreneur. It's an opportunity to give back. Mentor. Give back. You owe that to the next generation. That's just a little bit about me. I'm just an average Joe. I made average grades here. Maybe even below average. <laughs> but you've got a wonderful opportunity. You live in a time of unprecedented opportunity. Of all the times and the generations that are on this earth, there has never been a time to, like today to succeed. If you want to, everything is out there for you to be anything you want to be. Whatever that is, unprecedented opportunity out there today. Don't let anybody tell you that there's not. Don't let anybody tell you, well, the good old days, you can't build wealth or you can't do this. That, they, they're, they're full of bull crap. Never. Has there been more opportunity out there? I wish I was your age again. Oh, I wish I was your age again and know what I know today. Unprecedented opportunity. Take advantage of it. Do what you want to do. Don't be afraid to fail. Work your butt off. Life is good, baby. Life is good. Thank you for letting me speak here. I think we have time for at least one question. Who wants to be first? Question out there. I think I saw a hand right back there was the first hand I saw. Who was it? Right there. So you said that you care about people, number one. I yeah. would think that your family is number one. So with you working 80 hours a week, I wonder, what do you do to make time for your family? 
Well, great question. Uh, my son works on the farm with me, so I have an opportunity to interact with him. My wife comes and has lunch with me, or she will go on business trips with me. My daughter lives in Salt Lake. She kind of sometimes gets the short end of the stick. But what we try to do is have we, we don't we have quality versus quantity, and I've realized that you can debate that. But it, you know, empty nesters and everything. What we try to do is is when we go, we try to do a few things as a family. But we a lot of our businesses are family businesses. Um, if I could get my son-in-law to move to Kansas, he would be part of that. I've been trying to get him to be part of it. And there's nothing like working together as a family. So that, that, I would tell you that. But my wife would also tell you that I get five to 600 emails a day, and I'm always on my cell phone. She kind of doesn't like, like that. But that's what we do. So. Awesome. Let's have one more round of applause for Tom Willis.